Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build this Auto Blender AB40 Ferro Via Ria. This is a 135th scale model from Italeri. I think this is quite an interesting looking vehicle, in its own sort of ugly way. The parts in this box are pretty good, but we're not going to go into that in depth in this video. I did make a What's in the Box video specifically to talk about that, and the Auto Blender one is the first of that series I did. There's a link to that video in the description, and in the card at the upper right corner now. So if you do want a more in depth look at the contents of this box, pause this video now and go check it out. We'll wait. Ok, now that's done, let's get to the build. The first step involves building the frame of the vehicle. How novel. I did put the left side on before hitting record, but it's just a simple matter to get it onto the frame bottom part. I then add the front crossbar thing, whatever you might call that. You can tell this is the front because there's an arrow on the inside of the bottom part, which is pretty helpful. The rear frame part comes next. I did find it a little bit fiddly to get all of the frame parts on straight. There is some keying, but they don't completely help with the positioning, and you have to eyeball quite a bit of it. I add the right side part, which also required a bit of nudging and eyeballing. I got the frame parts together as straight and neat as I could, but it's definitely not perfect. That's probably half the kit's fault and half mine. Ah uh, well, it could be worse. Moving along, there's a couple of curved bars to add. I don't know exactly what function these perform inside of the hull, but they must do something, otherwise they wouldn't be there would they? These are different for each end. You can tell the difference between the parts by the holes in either part. Those holes should face in towards the centre of the frame. Nothing too tricky about installing these. Next it's time to install the suspension gear. I start with the lower brackety thing. There are four of these parts though they come in pairs which are slightly different to each other. They're not too hard to install, but do make sure that you're using the correct parts. Probably a good idea to clip the first two parts off the sprue, install them, then clip out the next pair. After that, I add these steering control rod things. There's one of these for either end of the auto blender. Then I install the upper brackety part for the suspension. Like the lower ones, be sure that you are using the correct parts. These are a little bit more fiddly than the lower set, mostly because there's additional bits. These go on either side. Do be careful with them. The plastic doesn't seem all that strong, especially when it's got glue on it. If you apply too much force to these, they can break. Ask me how I know. Next I install another different brackety thing on the inside of the wheel hubs. This is simple enough. Of course do be sure to use the correct parts in the correct orientation. A drive shaft can then be installed into the sockety thing, like so. And once you're confident that'll stay there, these assemblies, of which there are four, of course, can be installed. It takes a bit of fiddling and nudging to get them to clip into the suspension gear, and a little bit of gentle bending to get the drive shaft to sit nicely in the opening in the frame sides. That's not too difficult, just be careful not to apply too much pressure or you may end up breaking something, and you don't want that, I assume. I did quite a bit of nudging to get the wheels to sit as straight and neatly as I could. It's definitely not perfect, and it was a bit time consuming, but I got there in the end, and now the frame has four sets of wheel hobs, steering and suspension gear. I glued as many contact points as I could find to add some strength. The following step doesn't involve adding any wheels, and we won't be doing that for a while. Instead I work on the auto blender's body. First I add these little shelfy things to the inside of the left and right halves of the hull. This is simple enough. These probably won't be visible during normal use, unless you model the doors open, I suppose. I won't be doing that. I then install these internal support bars, I guess you might call them. I don't think it matters which side you attach these to, and once they're in, I join both halves of the body together. Of course the fit does have a fair bit of play in it, so before things get bonded into place, potentially being misaligned, I attach the lower rear plate. This should help getting things all nicely aligned. Though the fit certainly isn't perfect, it's not too bad after a bit of gap nullifying pressure. At this point I realised there were some holes that needed to be drilled in the hull side parts. It clearly would have been better to do this when they were both separate parts, but I didn't really feel like ripping them apart. Pays to pay attention to the instructions folks. 
I got the holes drilled anyway, so that's nice. I was a bit more diligent with the drilling from this point on. So much so that it's what I did next. Both the roof and engine deck parts needed holes drilled in them. I'm sure you've seen plenty of holes being drilled before, so we probably don't really need to cover that too extensively. Because I am a bit of a dunderhead, I forgot to film the assembly of this plate. There's a machine gun which is held in place by a ring on the back. If you are careful with how you glue this together, you should be able to have this ball mounted gun be movable. My preference is to glue it all solidly in place, though I did leave it movable here so that I could decide the final positioning with it installed on the vehicle. In doing so the ring around the mount part isn't super important, but it will add a bit of extra strength. I set that assembly aside and then attached the rear grille part. I don't think I got this part installed quite perfectly, though it is on and it doesn't look too bad. I then attached the engine deck. I did have to do a non-zero amount of fiddling and nudging to minimise the gap between this part and the grill and make sure the lower sides of the hull all lined up with as few gaps as possible. And the fit is a bit poor, but I got it to a point where I figured it was as good as it was going to get. I'm almost definitely going to have to do a bunch of putty work here later. The gaps are probably still a bit too big to pass off as believable for riveted construction. I then install the plate I assembled earlier. I guess you would call this the rear fighting compartment wall, or maybe there's a more fancy name for it. This required nudging and fiddling and pressure to get the best fit I could. This is going to be a continuing theme. When I'm satisfied, I position the machine gun and add glue so that it'll stay where I put it. Then why not add a roof? This is relatively simple. It's just a big flat rectangle. Though obviously do be sure that you're putting it on the right way around and the right way up. The raised lumpy thing and the two holes drilled earlier should be towards the rear of the vehicle. Speaking of drilling, the front plate needs two holes drilled in it. No missing drilling steps for me, probably. I then assemble the upper front plate. This is pretty simple and is really just a matter of installing the cover over the vision slot and these little covers that go over the headlamps. There's nothing especially tricky about this. They look like they should be quite effective at stopping light. This is great for when you want to have your lights on, but you don't actually want to use them. The real purpose is probably more to protect the lamps. I then install that upper front plate and it's pretty easy to do. Of course pressure and fiddling is involved and there are still some gaps left afterwards. Why not follow that with the front plate part I drilled holes in a few moments ago. This is also pretty simple to get into place with the nudging and pressure I've already mentioned 5000 times. The upper part of this should sit inside the notch or cutout or whatever you want to call it in the front plate. Eventually it's on good and proper and it isn't too gappy. Into the holes drilled earlier I install doodads. I have no idea what these are or what they do, they just go where the instructions want them to go. These could be fuel fillers or something like that. I'm sure somebody that isn't me knows. I install the engine hatches next. These are pretty simple. The shape of these parts makes it so that you should have a pretty hard time installing them incorrectly. That said, the fit isn't super great and I did have to apply a fair bit of pressure. They don't look too bad. Maybe they've just been a bit roughed up in service. Next, to stop the crew from falling out of the auto blender, or I guess to stop the bad guys from getting in, I add the doors. No, not the band. Each door is made up of two parts. Or does that count as four doors, two on either side? Either way, I install the lower one first, because that seems to make sense, and then the top part. The fit is actually fairly decent here. I did still have to apply pressure, but there wasn't too much fiddling involved. Door handles are next, because how else are you going to open the doors? By punching them? This isn't Minecraft, you know. These were fiddly to install, but that was almost entirely owing to them being rather small bits. Now seems like as good a time as any to join the frame and body. This is fairly simple. Slide the frame into the bottom of the body part, apply pressure until it's in the correct position, and then add glue to any contact points you can find. It does make the auto blender look a bit more complete, though clearly it's still a fair way from that. I mean, the lower front plate part isn't even installed yet. Better get that on now. There's not really much to it. 
Again, pressure, nudging, holding it for a while, and then it's on. Clearly not perfect, but it'll do the job. For whatever reason, I or the instructions decided that now is the time for building the turret. I start by gluing the turret bottom into the upper part. If you're going to follow the instructions precisely, which I'm not going to do because I'm a rebel, there are a few extra detail-y parts that would go in here. Stuff like elevation and turret rotation controls. Because my turret is going to be buttoned down, big surprise, none of that stuff is going to be seen, so I'm just going to omit it. It'll make a nice addition to the bits box. Assembling the gun mantlet is next. The mantlet part goes into the frame part, which isn't too tricky, though if you do want the guns to be able to elevate and depress, you'll want to be a bit more careful with the glue than I was. Then this frame part goes onto the back of that. I suspect this is to hold it all together if you do want working elevation. I don't, but I'm installing it anyway for extra strength. I test fit, because always test fit, then I install the guns. These simply slot in through the back of the mantlet like so. There is a fair bit of play here, and I had to nudge them quite a lot before they were sitting how I thought they should, but I got there eventually, and I think it looks pretty decent. It doesn't really seem like much of a main armament, but then you probably wouldn't go around in an auto blender trying to murder tanks, so I'm sure it was probably plenty for its role. I set that aside, and then assembled the searchlight. Installing the lens was pretty simple. There's no clear parts in the kit for this, which does seem a little bit odd. Anyway, I managed to break the mounting bracket for this, but I carefully glued it back together. Unfortunately, it's never going to be quite as strong as it once was, and it was never very strong to begin with. So I would advise you to be gentle with this. I did consider replacing this with wire, and I might still do so. I then installed the turret hatch. This is about as simple as any hatch is to install, which is to say quite simple. Again, pressure was applied to make sure the part bonded in place properly. Then I went to install the matlet assembly, and I discovered that the gun grips were preventing this from going all the way into place. They aren't going to be visible, so I simply gave them the chop. After that, it fit much better. Then, for whatever reason, I didn't glue the gun matlet on. Instead, I added the... I guess they're ventilation covers or something? There's one of these on either side of the turret towards the front. They're very simple to install, and they look pretty good. Much better than the empty slots that were there previously. I then installed a searchlight on the left side of the turret. This was a bit fiddly owing to the part being weak and easily broken, but I did get it on there. And then I installed the guns and matlet part, which fit quite easily. Though of course our old friend Pressure still makes a return. And that's the turret completed. It is pretty simple, though of course I did omit a bunch of parts that won't be seen. Next, this, I'm guessing it's just a splash guard, is mounted on the roof using the holes I drilled there. And then this towing hoop thing goes on the front plate here. I like to imagine this is used for stringing a bunch of auto blenders together to form a train. That's likely not what this is for though. I then assembled the air horns. This is made up of three pieces, and it is a little bit fiddly. Holding the base part with tweezers was a really good course of action. It takes a good amount of nudging and fiddling, but eventually it does go together. Then I set it aside to bond, because I know that if I try to install it right away, I'm just going to undo all of my gluing efforts and then be sad. So in the meantime, I install whatever this is on the side of the body. Is it a fuel filler? I've no idea. I follow this with a pair of hooks on the front plate. These seem like they are meant to be angled outwards from the centre, and if not, I've made a mistake. They actually do look fine though. Next come these bump things. I have no idea what they are, and there's nothing to guide their positioning. I looked at the painting references in the instructions, and counted rivets to figure out where they should go. I guess I'm a rivet counter now. Well, time to go yell at randos on the internet about how many rivets there are. There's also a pair of doodads that go next to the hooks I just installed. These are fiddly owing to being small, but nothing too difficult to install. On the mudguards, without much of a guide for them at all, come the little ball-on-stick devices to help the driver see where the corners of the vehicle are. I'm sure someone has told me what these are actually called at least once, but I still forget. 
these are fiddly to nudge into place, mostly because there are no guides, but it's not that hard to do, and it looks to me as though I got them more or less in the right spot anyway. Then I installed the horn. You didn't think I'd forgotten about that, did you? Honking is quite important. I could never forget about that. The horns are fairly easy to place, here on the right front side of the model. Again, nudging did occur. Attaching the wheels seemed like a really good idea, so I did that next. This is a simple matter of gluing the wheels onto the little platey parts, and then gluing the little hubcap thing into place. The wheels aren't exactly straight, though they are fairly close, it is obvious that they are a little bit wonky. I'm pretty confident that will be corrected when it comes time to glue this to the rails, but that won't be until this is painted, and that's just not going to happen in this video. Might as well move on then. I installed this little footstep railing part, whatever you want to call it, and it's not surprising that this would go beneath the doors. This is easy enough to install and get nice and straight, though I probably wouldn't worry too much if it has been bent out of position. This looks like it could easily be damaged and bent during normal use. This isn't very focused, but you can see that I'm adding a little plate to the side of the hull here. There's actually one for either side, and they'll form the mountings for the parts that hold the wheels onto the side. The rivet detail actually works as a kind of keying for this, which is handy. Next I add the, I guess you would call it a bracket, for the sanding gear. I guess it also serves as a device to knock bits of debris off the track before it gets under the wheels, which does seem like a good thing to have. Being derailed doesn't seem like a lot of fun. Next, it's time to assemble the front sandboxes. These are different to the rear ones, but we'll get to those later. This is simple enough, though do be sure to pay attention to the way these two parts go together. It would be a shame if you were to get them on wrong. When those bits are together, we can install the sandpipe. There is a hole for this to mount into, which is simple, but because I'm not super confident in my ability to get the positioning of the pipe correct, I quickly install the box onto the vehicle. Once I find the right position of the box and glue it into place, I nudge the sanding pipe around until I find the spot for that too. This isn't particularly tricky, but you do need to do a lot of eyeballing and of course the old nudgeroo. Obviously there's one of these for either side of the auto blender, and installation is pretty much the same. Now it's time for wheels. Uh, the road wheels. We've already got the railway wheels installed, but there are road wheels too. The tyres are made of some sort of vinyl-y, rubbery material, and you simply slot the rim parts into the centre of these. There are two rims with nothing in the centre, and two with the hub things in the centre. I'm not totally sure if there's a specific way these should go around. Then I add three, what would you call these? Brackets? Wheelie holdy bits? Whatever. There are three of them for each set of wheels, and they go over the existing bolt details. Next I superglue the two wheel sets together, one with an empty centre and one without. I'm pretty confident that plastic cement is not going to bond this stuff, so I use superglue. Then I nudge the wheel holdy bits around so that they're in contact with the other rim, I glue this in place with a bit of nudging, and then leave the wheels to bond for a bit. Next comes the antenna. I guess if you wanted to you could install this in the up position, but it is much less likely to break if you've got it folded down. I forgot to show these bracket things being glued to the wheels, but as you can see they are there. But I'm going to leave these off until they're painted, which I think is a pretty good choice. I then install a shovel here on the side of the engine deck. There are no guide pins or anything like that for it, but there are some plates moulded into the hull that these should sit on like so. And there's another one for the other side. I guess one good shovel deserves another, as the kids are so fond of saying these days. Then come some hooks at the lower rear sides. These are of course a bit fiddly to install owing to the size and shape, but it's not too hard. Next I start assembling the rear sandboxes. These are a bit different to those at the front, and by a bit I mean significantly, both in shape and the way that they go together, though to be honest it is pretty simple. When they're together, I glue them to the hull. Again, obviously one on either side. I figured it should be fairly easy to get the sanding pipes on with the boxes in place already. Before installing that pipe though, we need these bar things. I'm assuming these serve the same purpose as those on the front of the vehicle. As a railway vehicle, this thing probably runs in reverse just as much as forward. 
I mean, why bother turning it around if it can go just as fast in reverse? After that, I install this viewport cover. I've positioned it so that it's kind of open. I'm not totally sure this is completely correct, but it looks fine to me. You could totally see out of that. Then I assemble the muffler. This is a simple matter of gluing the two halves together, though it did need a little nudging to minimise the gaps, especially at the opening. I focus these efforts on the sides that will face out away from the vehicle, because that is the side that will be most visible. While that's bonding, I attach this pickaxe here on the right side behind the front wheel. Very pickaxe. Then this bar goes on the rear grille. There doesn't seem to be any specific way for this to be mounted, rather it just sort of sits in the lowest gap on the grille. Or it could be that I'm installing it incorrectly. Either way, after some nudging, it's on the model, and it should stay there. Then, before I forget, I install the rear sanding pipes. As I suspected, it was easy to get these into place with the boxes already installed on the vehicle. The pipe runs down over the outside of the bar thing that hangs down, and it should line up with the wheel, because obviously that's where we want the sand to go. I think this looks pretty good. Then I attach the muffler. This is easy enough though as you can see, if you install this before the sanding pipes, you'll probably have a hard time with the pipe on the right. Next, I assemble the rear lampy things. There are two of these and they're very simple to put together. Again, the lenses are solid opaque plastic and not clear plastic, but I suppose at least that's consistent with the rest of the kit. I follow that not by installing the lamps, but instead I add this log to the rear. There's nothing to guide this, so you just have to eyeball it. I guess this has the same use as the logs on Soviet tanks, and not just because it's fun to have wood. <laughs> and then I installed the butt lamps. <laughs> Butts. I'm sure we had many fun jokes about this on stream when I was building this. These were actually quite fiddly, and I think it might have been a better idea to install these before the sandboxes, just to have a little bit more room for the fat fingers. I did eventually get them on in such a way that I was okay with them. The rear is looking pretty good, but there is still a little bit more to add such as this shackle. Like I said earlier, I would like this to be for forming a train of auto belenders, but it's far more likely that it's for pulling this thing out of ditches, or pulling other things out of ditches, and things like that. I try to position it in such a way that it makes sense in relation to how gravity works. Then I add this rectangular plate with round thing. That's the technical term. I'm not totally sure, but I think I've got this positioned correctly. Like pretty much every other little doodad in this kit, this one needed to be eyeballed, because there's not really any keying for it. Then comes, and you shouldn't be at all surprised by this, a part that I can't identify. Whatever it is, the instructions say that it goes here, and again, there isn't really anything to guide it. And that's the auto blender completed. But don't forget, we also have some rails to assemble. This is quite simple. As you can hopefully see, the rails are shaped such that there's no guess as to where they sit on the sleepers, which is very convenient. I glue all of the sleepers to one piece of rail, and then it's very easy to add the other section of rail. There are two of these to make, and once they're done, they can be joined together. The ends where the rails overhang the ends of the sleepers have some holes, and that's where we attach the joiner plates. There's probably an actual name for these, but I don't know what it is. Then it's done, and the auto blender can be placed on its rails. The wheels, being not quite perfect, don't really seem to want to sit on the rails properly, but they are close. It'll be much better when this is painted and can be glued onto the rails, but for now, that's it. The auto blender in 1 35th scale by Atalari is completed. I think the result is fairly decent. It is definitely not perfect, and there are plenty of gaps to be sure. These will of course need to be fixed or otherwise hidden, but it could definitely be a lot worse. I did manage to break one of the bars that hold the road wheels in place at some point between completing the build and putting it on the turntable. I guess me breaking the parts doesn't really have a lot to do with the kit itself. Though I will say that the plastic can be a little bit delicate, and there are a fair few bits that could easily be broken. I suppose that is the risk you have to take if you want parts to be in scale. 
there were a few mounting pins that I managed to damage, particularly in the suspension, and those were weakened when I added glue, so I would definitely suggest being careful with those parts. That probably goes without saying really, but I've said it anyway. The build wasn't too bad anyway, and if I had to complain about anything it would be the number of parts that didn't have anything to guide them. Having to eyeball the position of parts isn't really a huge issue, but the instructions were often not especially helpful, which obviously compounds the problem. It is a minor complaint anyway, and I think I got most of the things where they should be. Speaking of the build, if you want to watch me build things like this live on stream, head on over to twitch.tv slash herbert underscore erpaderp, or follow the handy dandy link in the description below. I've got some really cool builds planned, so give me a follow and come hang out. It did take me a few streams to get this thing built, there were after all quite a few parts. Not only that, but a fair bit of cleanup was also required. I wouldn't say an extraordinary amount of cleanup, but certainly enough. To be fair though, that is just part of building models. I'm obviously not any kind of expert, but I think the detail this kit has is pretty good. I'm sure the rivet countery types are already hammering away at their keyboards to disagree, but it looks like an auto blender, and it has all the various bits that an auto blender has. So for pretty much everybody but the most picky, I'm sure this is fine. Also, do keep in mind that this is a fairly cheap kit. It's no Zvezda, but it's not super expensive either. There's no photo etch or clear plastic parts included, so if you're looking for that kind of thing you might have to look elsewhere. Italeri does also make at least one other version of the Auto Blender. The non-rail version which comes without the sandboxes and has rubber wheels where this one has the rail wheels. I'm sure that if you wanted to, you could also build this kit in that configuration. In the end, I think this kit is fairly decent. It's not the best model I've ever seen, but definitely not the worst. It wasn't especially difficult to put together, though it was a bit time consuming. It was a reasonably fun build for the most part, and it is going to take a bit more work with the putty before it's finished, but I'm happy enough with the result. It's an interesting vehicle and something a little bit different to what I would normally do, that being tanks, while still being relevant to my interest in World War II and armoured vehicles in general. So, what do you think? Have you built this kit yourself? Is there another auto blender kit that you prefer? Let me know in the comment section below. And if you have built one of these, feel free to come on over to my Discord server and share some pictures. If you've enjoyed this video, or found it to be helpful in some way, it would be awesome if you were to share it with your friends or anybody you think might get something out of it. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe, follow, ring the bell, become a patron or YouTube member, and all of the other things you do on YouTube and social media. Links to all of my things are in the description below. And as always, I shall return soon. So until then, be excellent to each other, and thanks for watching. Farewell.